Hi everybody, welcome to the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society August tasting. Great to see you all here. Uh, we'll hope to hear from you as we go through the evening. Let me first introduce myself. Some of you don't may know me as John McChain, but this is our science fiction month theme. So for this evening, my name is Tiberius, okay? And the first one who comes on the screen there and tells us what, what the connection is there will get a free dram from me. I did this, did this right, and it took about 10 seconds, so I'm expecting a very quick answer. Tiberius, okay? Now, what we've got for you tonight is something very, very special. Uh, we are, we're going to go into some of the geeky aspects of a whiskey process. And to help us, we've got one of my colleagues, and we've got Michael from Loch Lomond, who will introduce shortly, and also when we get to the Loch Lomond whiskies. But my colleague, Andy Forrester, Doc, Andy Forrester, in the white coat, the mad professor there, who... Uh, we all call the geek, but he insists he's not a geek. But look at him. Look at him. You know, crazy. Andy and I have crossed paths for many years. Uh, and Andy's done many jobs in the whiskey business, including an, an ambassador for Balveni. But in the last few years, he's a, he's a scientist. I think it's botany, I think you've got a degree in. Andy, is that right? And the Scotch, Scotch Whiskey Research Institute, until very recently, and now he's joined the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society to help us with our spirits education programme. Andy, can I ask you to introduce yourself and just tell us a little bit about your career? Yeah, evening, John. Evening, all. I hope everyone's in, in good spirit this evening. Um, we certainly will be by the time we've we've got through this. Um, so, uh, Tiberius, can I call you John? I think you've <laughs> caught you, guy. <laughs> so... As you say, John, uh, we've our paths have crossed many times over the years. I think I met you some 15 years ago at a whiskey festival down in London. I That's might right. well have even been. So my first job in the industry was working with uh, John Mark and Robbo's Easy Drinking Whiskey Company. Uh, funnily enough, talking all about flavour. And um, I think we probably saw each other from time to time sitting on tasting panels because I think both you and I, uh, have, have participated in the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society tasting panel. I think we're going to talk a little bit about what we do later. Um, from John Mark and Robbo's, I went on and I was for six years. I worked for Willie Grants and uh, was the UK ambassador for the Bulveni Distillery. Utterly fabulous job, wonderful distillery, wonderful people. Uh, lucky to work with people like David Stewart. From there, I, I think I, what did I do then? Yeah, went to the Scotch Whiskey Research Institute, uh, where I was a senior scientist. And primarily my role was to translate or, I guess, uh, yeah, to, to translate the sort of more academic research that we were doing into something that the distilling industry could use. For those who don't know, the Scotch Whiskey Research Institute is um, an industry-owned collaborative research and technology organization dedicated to the needs of the industry. Almost everybody's a member, us included, and we all benefit from uh, this joint funded whiskey club um, that looks at everything from serial improvement for distilling through uh, what happens in the distillery, the origin of flavor, uh, maturation science, and even elements around sort of Scotch whiskey, um, I guess, um, or the protection of Scotch whiskey uh, from counterfeiting and, uh, and fraud. Uh, so fascinating times. Incidentally, that was me back to the lab. My Before I stumbled quite literally into the Scotch whiskey industry, uh, as John says, I was studying plant biology. I did my PhD in York and looked at how plants grow and develop. Um, yeah, and then I find myself at the Scotch, uh, Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. Uh, my official job title is a spirits educator, but I mostly seem to be referred to as the resident geek or, <laughs> or Dr. Andy. I have absolutely no idea at all why they say um, I'm a geek. I could tell, I could tell everyone over the, the last few months of lockdown, you put together a tremendous programme for the people in the society and whiskey education with people from the industry coming to talk about factors involved in whiskey process and flavour. It's been quite fascinating, Andy. So well done. But can I ask, what the dickens is that? Hanging that. Up? Yes. 
that's that's my giant Ebola virus. <laughs> okay. So I have a, as well as a fascination with plants, I have a fascination with viruses. So I've got a bacteriophage. Um, okay, technically a bacteria, but it's a leprosy. Um, and this inquiry, well, sealed safely in a jar is my coronavirus. See, I told you, folks, the man is mad. The man is mad. Okay. So, John, the, the lockdown's been funny because I think I've seen more of you uh, during lockdown than That's ever. Right. That's because, right. as you That's say, right. three days a week for the best part of two or three months, we 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 were together almost in a room with, what is it, sort of 40, 50 of our colleagues, yeah. yes. Yes. colleagues from, from all over Europe and the rest of the world uh, talking about flavour and where does it come from in the whiskey production process and uh, people like Richard Patterson joined us, Jack Mayo from Holyrood Distillery. Who else did we have? Well, we had the we had the David Robertson from Holyrood as well. David Robertson, it's, Flavor uh, Graphic. We had yeah. uh, Alice today from who yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. John for Dice from the New Borders Distillery. Yeah, so uh, of, yeah. That's one right. of the things, everyone is um, as you'll know, our industry is very, very sort of sociable and everybody gets on really well, despite being fiercely competitive when it comes to the bottle. Um, but it was great because literally I was picking up the phone to some of my friends in the industry and, you know, the sentence was barely out of my mouth before the answer was yes. And it was, look, we're running these seminars for ambassadors. Would you would you come and give a guest speaker slot and talk about your area of expertise? And absolutely everybody said yes. And there's a waiting list. Okay, stop. But one of the fascinating <coughs> things tonight, folks, I, uh, I'm just going to say, there's quite a few answers came in about the Tiberius, Andy, but I think Rob McKendrick got it first. I think it's Andrew, Andrew's maybe saying that Rob McKendrick and Stuart Donovan were dead heats. So you'll be getting a wee sample dram from me. I don't know how we'll arrange that, but we'll maybe get, I'll maybe get emails or something. Obviously, I'll need addresses too, and we'll get that sorted. Well done, guys. Tiberius is the middle name of Captain James T. Kirk, for those of you who never saw that coming up. Now, all of the all of the people who are participating in this tasting got an email with all of the kind of accompanying stuff, the tasting mat, the tasting notes. So you all know that at the end of the tasting, there's an opportunity to get a hold of some of these bottles, the ones you particularly enjoy. It's a code just for you for tonight. The only one that's not available is number seven, because we're trying to get as many members to sample that one as possible, and there's no actual full bottles left. Uh, there are also on the site lots of deals on buying two of the bottles or three of the bottles. There's even mem new membership offers and renewal of membership offers alongside a bottle. If you get to look through all that. Very, very good deals indeed. So tonight we're going to be tasting two whiskies from Speyside. And then we're going to bring Michael in, who you saw right at the beginning, because Michael's the master blender of the distiller, a fascinating distillery that makes all different types of flavours in, in, in a single distillery, very much like what happens in Japanese distilleries as opposed to Scotch whisky distilleries. So the other thing we're going to do, Andy and I are going to be drinking these first two space sides with you. Now, Andy and I had a chat and we agree, what do whisky ambassadors do? They come along and they tell you that everybody's nose is different and everybody might get something different. And then we tell you what you're going to taste. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's true. So, we are, so, so, so we're not going to do that today. We're going to enjoy the whiskies and see how, why we're enjoying them. But let you tell us if you've got a mind to about uh, what the flavours you are getting the, from them yourself. You've got the tasting notes there. Two ways to do this, by the way. If you read the tasting note and then sniff the whiskey, all you're trying to do is establish some of the aromas and flavours that you've just read about. The much more fun way to do it is just see what you get and then look at the tasting note to see if there's a comparison. But no one person is ever going to get all of those flavours that our tasting panel come up with. Okay, so we're going to talk about the tasting panel a bit later on as well. So let's go to the first one. 58, 58.38 in a sunny lemon grove. 
Now this uh, this whiskey is sixty four percent, I think it is. So this is one we would definitely recommend that once you've nosed it and sampled it neat, then you want to try it with a little bit of water as well. You know, it is. Uh, it's from our young and sprightly flavour profile, and it's from a second fill bourbon barrel, and it's only seven years old, is it? So, so let's see. We should get a lot of distillery character from this. Let's see what we get. Let's see if we can enjoy it. So, John, do you, do you see that? What? Um, so. Um, some of some some of you will know um, of our colleague Andrew Park, who who sent the packs out and sent you the wee email. Out. And look, Andrew's uh, doing the production tonight. And look, does that look familiar, John? He's what he <laughs> ah, yes. Is that a yes, indeed. Yes, Is that indeed. Yes. Well, but what we what we thought we might do because of the science fiction theme and Back to the Future and all of that is maybe talk about some of the things that happened on the dates the whiskies were distilled. I personally always think it's fascinating because of because we're a single cask, we can tell you the exact date of distillation. And I always just think it's fascinating to wonder what was going on on that day at that distillery and how it connects us many years later with the people who made that whiskey on that day at the distillery. So one of the things we looked up on the on the internet, I think Andrew came up with this one, actually, Andrew Parks, Andy Murray won his first Grand Slam on the day that this whiskey was distilled, 10th of December 2012. And what I tell you what, it was some game. I don't know if any of you can remember it. He was 7 6, 7 5 up after two sets. Then he lost the next two, 6 2 and 6 3, before he got himself back together and won the final set 6 2. So here's the Andy Murray in Scotland. That was a very, very good thing. Let's have a little sniff of this whiskey and see what we think. So John, John, um, given given we 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 have the Delorean, uh, maybe maybe what we should do is go back in time and think about where some of the distillery character comes from in this, yes. and then okay. go back to the future, and we can have a chat about the cask and some of the influence of the cask. What do you think? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and I think let's hear some comments from people and some questions. Yeah, that's a great idea because whisk whiskey whiskey. Flavors, two things really. It's what was in the new make spirit, how that new make spirit reacts to the cask whilst it matures. So you're trying to, as you sniff and taste a whiskey, to establish what is the new make, uh, what is the distillery character from new make spirit and what has happened in the cask. You wouldn't expect a lot actually to be contributed by this cask, Andy, would you? Because the second fill, bourbon barrel, so not, not a long number of years. Yeah, I, I, I guess you, you never know, and that's that's the wonderful thing. Even John Connor, who's the head maturation scientist at the Scottish Whiskey Research, Inter uh, Research Institute, he'll spend an hour giving a presentation on their research and then say, well, it depends on the cask, <laughs> which is <laughs> which is the joy of single cask, single malt whiskey, or, or, or any whiskey, you know, any single cask whiskey. Um, I mean, ultimately, it depends how, how long was that cask used before, so... You know, it could be a second fill, but it, it may have only ever been used for a short period for, say, yeah. a period of additional maturation. Um, but I think you're right. I mean, it's certainly back in time with the DeLorean for me. I think there's lots of what I would describe more as distillery um, uh, of flavours and aromas that originate in the distillate. Um, so I know we said we weren't going to say, what does this smell of? But it's sort of more of a fruity, floral, sort of light fresh estuary, we say esters are the fruity flavoured compounds, usually floral aromas. It, it seems to be more dominated by that than the cask, but the cask has, has, has done its job. It's softened, it's mellowed, and it's removed the immature character. I know we talked about this earlier, John. I think it's pretty, um, very right. Yeah. And, and I think you said, um, you know, it's typical. I was chatting to, I've chatted to two different people about the the, the, the distillery character for this particular distillery. And one says it's light, fruity, and estuary, and the other said it's kind of more heavy, oily. Yeah, I've got that down here. I read read two books, read two books about South Isla, and one said that the new mix spirit is sweet, fruity, and estuary. The other one said it's oily, heavy, and robust. Which just goes to show, what does what do they know? 
the interesting thing, I mean, this is literally, I mean, John and I, are, I, well, I assume you as well, John, we're tasting these for the first time tonight as well. Yes, and yes. Um, certainly I found with without water, lots and lots of fruit and floral aromas, as soon as I put the water in, there's definitely an oiliness. It's definitely there. Yeah, I think I think at first without the water, I think it's just very lively, effervescent, <laughs> uh, they look sparkling wine, you know. And I think the water does tone that down a little bit. I would, I would definitely, if I had the bottle of this at home, I would definitely, after I try that, I would think I'm going to drink the rest of that with a touch of water in it. I prefer it. Yeah. So no, it's yummy. And I can see it, it, it's actually massively spicy. And um, I mean, I would put that down to wood influence. You know, I think that's coming from the bourbon cast from the American oak. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, and, and there's a sweetness. And, you know, it, it could equally be, you know, is it, it's sweet and spicy. But, you know, I, I see why the tasting panel, when they nosed and described this whiskey, why they assigned it to the, um, the young and sprightly. Really, yeah. Because it's got that lovely kind of zesty, effervescent feeling on the palate. It almost fizzes, doesn't it? I um, I was just noticing there as we were speaking that Andrew and Marianne from Luxembourg have joined. Welcome. And also Anne, Anne Bingham, Southampton, good to see you. And somebody just come up and said that the date of distillation was their wedding anniversary. Oh, congratulations, guys. Yeah, congratulations. Do you know that the famous Billy Connolly, the Scottish comedian, said once, he said, marriage is a great invention. But then again, so is a bicycle repair kit. <laughs> I don't get it. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. Well... It's not actually today, is it, John? <laughs> but yes. Yeah, well, well, someone was. Yeah, it was anniversary. Well, well, is, no, I said it was the 24th wedding anniversary on that day. Ah, got you. No, no, no what, why uh, Dan's asking why is this one so strong? I think it's, um, you know, is it, you mean in terms of the alcohol content, Dan, I presume you mean yes. Uh, I, that would depend on the... The, the circumstances around maturation in terms of climate whereabouts in the warehouse, we're, we're assuming that it went in at 63.5 and actually developed more alcohol content as the during the time of maturation, which is very unusual in Scotland. It's very, very seldom that in, in Scotland we fill casks at spirit still spit. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you're right, John, and, you know, it is, um, who was it, um, you know, it is, it is quite a high ABV. It hasn't lost a lot of a lot of alcohol uh, during those seven years of maturation. Typically, we would expect to see, you know, rule of thumb, you know, maybe a half a percent ABV per year. We would see the reduction in strength. Um, I mean, you're probably right, John. I mean, you know, th there's been periods when the industry has filled casks at higher strength. Um, yeah. But mostly, it's that 63 and a half for a you know yeah. specific reason. Um, sure. Of course, it was never. I don't think it was ever designed this way. Uh, I think the reason more was it allowed distillers to trade more easily. That's right. Um, yeah, that's right. As, as I understand it, yeah. But, but the reality is, you know, some of the work that's been done looking at the uh, fill strength and maturation suggests that, you know, actually we maybe hit a pretty good strength in terms of getting the best from the cask. So it's one yeah. of those serendipitous uh, lucky accidents uh, that seem to be um, what the Scotch whiskey industry is built on. This uh, this distillery is always thought of as one of the most picturesque uh, in Scotland, and I was in SMWS London many years, several years ago, more than I care to remember, probably. And a man there celebrating his birthday with his wife. His wife had brought in a birth had brought in for him a birthday cake made in the shape of this distillery. Quite fascinating. <laughs> With, so was that, was that, was that I think yeah, yeah, me, yeah, all that. the iconic twin yeah, twin go there, go there. yeah, yeah, yeah. John, I'm I, proud of you. You still haven't mentioned the distillery name. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm probably, I probably have. I probably oh, have. have you? Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. It's lovely. What well, a lovely drum. Um, you know. Um, There's lots of questions here. I, I, and one, oh. one, somebody asked. What determines the decision for us to release this now? Ooh, well, that's it. That is a good Bernard, question. Bernard Crump, Bernard and Isa are asking that question. 
Okay. And are there any more for me to just lens it? That's a good shout, yeah. by the way, Mark Lindsay. Lend, yeah, lens yeah, it, I, kind of citrusy I, and almost that kind of yeah. paracetamol like um, metallic I character. Agree. Any more, Andrew? Do you want to pop them up and we can maybe deal with a bunch of them at the same time? So, so I think, I mean, I think we were, we, I mean, ultimately, uh, the answer is the, the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society's tasting panel, of which um, I know, okay, um, it's supposed to be anonymous, but uh, John, you know, both you and I, I think we'll declare um, membership and that we're yeah. part of the panel um, amongst others. Uh, but ultimately, it's the panel that decides when our casks are going to be, um, uh, uh, when our casks are going to be released. I mean, obviously, I think what we try to do is put together a diverse uh, array of whiskies of different ages, from different flavour profiles, from different distilleries, from different casks. Um, but ultimately, we're sort of looking within a certain age range. So you and our spirits manager will be continuously pulling samples that are within this age range that we're looking to we're looking to bottle from, and putting them in front of the panel. And uh, our panels, um, our sensory panels, comprised of. Um, numerous, um, very experienced Scotch whisky drinkers, enthusiasts, and experts. And all of us, and I, I, do you know what, John? I should have got this from the garage, uh, the nosing test. Every yeah. panelist has been through a rigorous industry standard um, nosing, or sorry, aroma identification test that um, was designed by the Scotch Whisky Research Institute. That's for this program. Program. Yeah, yeah. Andy. Yeah. Okay. And, and so, so from so so it, it takes uh, the aromas from the Scotch whiskey flavour wheel, and the and, and the, 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 the the prospective panelist is asked to identify those particular aromas. You need a really high score to get onto the panel, and in fact, the reality is it's kind of in master blender territory. The score that we're looking for. So everybody on the panel's passed that, but we also do what they also have is a huge amount of whiskey production knowledge. Most of them have been, I think, John, you included have been to the Scotch Whiskey Research Institute and gone through their course on where does flavour come from in the production process. And I, with you, and continually monitor uh, the performance of the panel um, to understand people's and uh, um, people's sensory strengths, and people's strengths, sensory weaknesses, so we get the best out of our panel. And their job is ultimately to select the casks based on the quality of the spirit, they're all highly trained to recognise any off notes, recognise immaturity, uh, to ensure that we only bottle the whiskey when it should be bottled. Um, the other job, of course, is to write the poetic tasting notes that adorn the bottle. And I think, John, um, I remember sitting on a panel with you. Uh, you were far more experienced than I was at that time. And you said, you told me a little story. About, <laughs> uh, it kind of amuses me because... I think this is a good way to work. So do you want to do you want to tell everybody oh, yeah, that? Yeah, well, 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 people people sometimes ask us about our tasting notes. They're so expressive and extensive and they're full of memories of things gone by. And how does that happen? Well, the thing about tasting whiskey is that it can often remind you of a moment and a place. And I find that happens a lot. And I actually love it for that reason. It's not a mechanical thing, just drinking whiskey. It actually can be a spur to memory of uh, things that have happened in your past. So I was sitting on the tasting panel, and that day, Ewan Campbell, the spirits manager, was the tasting panel chairman. And I said to Ewan, at this whiskey, I said, oh, Ewan, I'm getting leather from an old car. And Ewan said, very good, John, but what is the model of the car? <laughs> And I'll tell you what, it's not as daft as it sounds because what you had sussed was that if I've got a memory working there and he could drag it out of me, then perhaps it makes for a more interesting tasting note than just leather from an old car. And as it transpires, my brother-in-law has a 1953-year-old Royce. And that's what was in my head, you know? No. So, it just, so it just shows that sometimes when you're, when you're tasting a whiskey, you might get something that no one else will get because it reminds you of a particular moment in time. John, I'm going to, I'm going to pick up on something else related to that. Uh, but I think what we should do is get this in the glass and um, move on to the next dram and yeah. check in with Andrew just to see if there's any other questions that have popped up. So I'm going to I'm going to pour myself a, a dram now of um, 
7.242 magical fairy dust which is a 26 year old from another just, uh, place. i'll just say, i'll just say hello to george mcneil hi hi george that's saw you come up there and also a question from surya kieran i think it was okay how is this how is this distillery able to make so many different whiskies maybe you you never got it right at the beginning surya kieran or came in late it's not this distillery we're going to be talking about in terms of different whiskies it's Whiskies three, four, and five, and we'll be having someone, Michael Henry, uh, master blender, is still at Loch Lomond, join us for that to discuss that. To talk that. Too. Yeah, I think we're going to get super deep into that, aren't we, John? So the question yeah, we sure. answered at length, which is what I like. So yeah, so I've poured seven point two four two magical fairy dust, twenty six year old, Speyside single malt whiskey from a refill ex bourbon hogshead. Apparently, and according to the DeLorean time circuits and the flux capacitor, I love that film. Sorry, distilled on the 20th of May, 1993. That's the year I went to university. Is it really? Yeah. All right. Anyway, so that's the whiskey. Um, let's talk about the whiskey. Let's go back in time, think about where it was distilled and what its origin, and then let's think about the cask. When we come well, back, I tell, you what, I tell you what's interesting. But one of the one of the things that's interesting about this distillery, some of you might be familiar with the name of a Japanese gentleman, Masataka Takitsuru. And Masataka Takitsuru came to study chemistry, Glasgow University after the First World War. Met a local girl from Kirkendilloch near Glasgow, but he did a bit of uh, who, who he married and took back to Japan. But he went to study Scotch whiskey distilling at a couple of distilleries, and this was one of the ones he went to. And when he went back to Japan, he modelled his first distillery on this distillery. And some people say Yoichi is like a, a carbon copy of this particular distillery. And I, was in, I was in Yoichi last... November, I think it was, and it's not true. <laughs> but uh, but it's an it's exceptional part of the, the history of this uh, this distillery. Well, it's been around since 1894. Um, isn't it, it, it? It's right next door to another one, isn't it? Is that right? It's right next door to, yeah, Ben Rear. Ben Rear, it is. Yeah. Anyway. Okay, yeah, so um, what did I want to say? So, okay, the whiskey. Um, as promised, we won't stand here and tell you what we think it tastes like because everybody has a very different perception of the whiskey, and I think we were going to pick up on some of that, John. I just wanted to pick up and and, and give, give everybody listening a little bit of an insight about what you and I and the others will do when we sit down uh, in the tasting panel to ensure that we accurately describe these whiskies and pick up anything that we need to to either put it on the bottle as a descriptor or even to alert us to the fact that maybe it's not maturing in the way that we want it to. Yeah, and yeah. Um, it relates a little bit to John's anecdote about the Rolls-Royce, 1953 Rolls-Royce, um, because essentially what, you know, you and it was encouraging there, John to do there was really just kind of, you know, expand the vocabulary uh, to give the poetic tasting notes that end up on the bottle. And I guess there's a similar process with uh, when we're, describing the flavor um, as we sit and nose it. And really one of the best things you can do is ask yourself a question initially. Don't just stick your nose in the glass and say, what do I get? That's not particularly necessarily helpful. Most master blenders will tell you, put your nose in the glass and say, do I smell sweetness? Do I smell fruit? Do I smell nuts? Do I smell cereal? And almost walk around, and I wish I had it, John, you can wave it perhaps. I, I, we almost take a walk around the inner tier of the Scotch whiskey flavour wheel, which has the primary aroma of the mouth and, and taste characteristics that we associate with Scotch whiskey. This is on the internet if anybody wants to find it. Uh, the Scotch whiskey research interest, uh, industry flavour wheel. So we kind of take a walk around there. And then obviously people have a different approach. My vocabulary is quite limited, um, but others is much more um, elaborate. But essentially, is there sweetness? Now I ask myself, what is that sweetness? Is it honey? Is it toffee? Is it caramel? Is it vanilla? Is it coconut sweetness? 
All of those different aromas may have different origin as well, interestingly. If it's fruity, is it citrus fruits? Is it orchard fruits? Is it soft berry fruits? If it's soft berry fruits, is it raspberries? Is it black currants? And essentially, get further and further out that flavour wheel. The Scotch whisky flavour wheel has three tiers. The primary aroma is in the middle and then sort of branches out to become a little bit more detailed. I often say that when we get to our label, we're often operating in almost a fourth tier, fourth dimension of this wheel that doesn't exist, but where we really do start to bring lovely analogies and memories and descriptions to, to, to describe the whiskies. I think, I think one of the points, Andy, you're, you're, you're emphasising there is that some people, some people lack confidence in saying what it is that they actually think they are nosing and tasting. And if you use that process, which you've just described, and, and the wheel, you, if you get the sweetness, you then can just start walk walk to the outside, the, the first, the second layer and the third layer of the wheel to actually drill it down into, uh, you know, more precise flavours. And before you know it, you'll have a structure and a thought process to your tasting, and you'll be on our tasting panel before you know it. Yeah. Well, I can say, um, so one of the one of the things we, I was involved in at the, at the Research Institute was looking at um, sensory science and flavour. And what I can tell you is we know that you can actually develop and improve your ability to uh, recognise and describe the aromas. It's practice, 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 practice. Really, just keep sticking your nose in a glass and recording your notes and you will get better and better at it. That said... And this is the important thing about when, when, when we look at our panel is everybody has different sensitivity to different compounds. And some people may be um, very sensitive to a particular aroma. Others may have almost no sensitivity at all. Some of the, some of the ones that we know where there's different, huge differences in people's sensitivity are um, uh, sort of software aromas which um, at very high levels or people with high sensitivity can, can be quite unpleasant or vegetal, decay-like, but at lower levels can be more kind of meaty and bovrily uh, and give, you know, that's what gives some of the body to some of these whiskies like Krigeliki and Mortlac. Uh, another one is um, oat lactones. So oat lactones are compounds that are free in American oat, you know, very high levels in American oat. They're drawn out into the whiskey and they're what give that kind of coconutty gorse flower character. And we know there's huge, this quite new recent research tells us that there's huge uh, differences in sensitivity there. So, John, this is why, we, I mean, we were chatting about this earlier, you know, this is why, you know, let's say we're looking, you know, we pick up this and we say, right, it's from a first fill cask, for example. And you start going on about, oh, massive, oh, sorry, the other way around. You go, oh, look, massive, massive gorse flower, coconut sweetness, la, 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 la. And uh, it must be from a first fill cask, you know. And somebody else is sitting there going, I don't smell any coconut. <laughs> because everyone has different sensitivities. People, so, yeah, people, yeah, absolutely. People have different uh, sensitivities to different flavours and aromas, Andy, as we know. And that's, that's why right. it's for us to stand and tell people what they should be experiencing. I mean, I mean, I have Sur Surya Kana is uh, asked another question about do the does the tasting change during the time we're on the panel? Uh it does, does the taste change over the time you folks are tasting the samples? And do some of them go just wow on the second tasting? I don't think that happens because, you know, we, we are, we're not sitting there for three quarters of an hour with every whiskey, you know. We want to try it neat, we want to try a little bit of water. But certainly flavours can change in, in the glass. And what we're trying to represent is a balance of what you're getting. I had a I had an SMWS whiskey just the other evening there. It was uh, an Aaron I'd had, had for a while. One, two, one. Sorry, I mentioned this the other day again. And I, I'd already drank half the bottle over recent months. And I tried the whiskey again. And I thought it was wonderful. I thought it was fantastic. One of the best whiskies I've tried this year. But I didn't think that when I had drank it before, you know. So you can actually have a different feeling of experience depending on when you're drinking it. And know what mood you're in, where you are, what food you've eaten, that kind of thing. You're right. I, I, I just spotted some people's descriptors there. So, Anne, I love that stuff about the trifle and the texture. This does have unbelievable texture. It really does. And um, I think Joel said something about how the dram is just developing over time. It just gets better and better. I mean, the short answer to the question is yes. It, you know, it, it changes over the course of, of sitting in the tasting panel. And, you know, sometimes, 
you have to really, you know, it really is worth just going back and looking at the sample again later because I mean a number of things are happening really. I mean certainly when you first pour the whiskey, um, lots of the more volatile compounds, the ones that are going to kind of fill the, the, the you know the space at the top of the glass and, and, and come into your nose, you know they're 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 much more dominant and that they'll start to eventually sort of I guess dissipate disappear and then you'll maybe start to smell some of the the less volatile aromas that are perhaps hiding further down in the glass. I mean, I kind of try and use a, a visual way of describing this. So, so yeah, and, and as John, as you say, you know, adding the water can change the whiskey profoundly. Um, it can really do, because, I mean, firstly, it's given you a chance to know more of the aromas that are present rather than being blinded by, you know, the alcohol and like particularly something with our first one, you know, our high strength one. Um, but also the, 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 you know, of the, you know, many hundreds of different flavor active compounds present in the spirit you know some are more soluble in water and some are more soluble in ethanol or alcohol and as the balance of or you know as the concentration of alcohol changes as we add water that shifts the solubility of these things and whether or not they're going to either sit in solution or pop out and actually reveal themselves to our nose and it's only when they pop out and reveal themselves to our nose that we'll, we'll actually smell anything you know to experience a flavor it needs to hit the um the, you know, the, 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 you know, inside the nasal cavity and the receptors in the nose. Stuart, it's an emotional reaction where you're mood, what you've eaten. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Stuart. Absolutely, Stuart. Uh, yeah, this is it. I mean, this is kind of now. Sorry, John. And, don't, and I also, Andy, someone, like I said, Shuri, Shuri Kieran has just uh, mentioned the thing about what happened on the day this was uh, distilled about that meteor being close to Earth. Someone is. Yeah, meteor comes within 150,000 kilometers of Earth. <laughs> and then he goes on to say, this sample is out of space for sure. That's no, one. Done. Well, that's one. Well, well done, yeah. No, that's, that, look, that's, yeah. that's a great fact and, 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 yeah, and yeah. Well, well on theme. Yeah, so two, two other things of this day, actually. On this day, one of our members back then was in a single-handed yacht race around the world, a 60-foot yacht. And fell out of his bunk on the boat and had to give up the race at Hobart because he'd broken his back. That was Alan Wynn Thomas. So Alan, if you're if you're around, all the very best. And, and and one other thing that you Scotsmen might get, maybe not other people, but you remember Rab C. Nesbitt. If you remember Rab C. Nesbitt uh, from that television series. Pip Hills, our founder, made Rab C. Nesbitt an honorary member on this day. <laughs> you, have they accused me of being the geek? Paul <laughs> asked a question. Paul, um, with a 26-year-old whiskey like this, how much is lost to the Angels? Well, the short answer is quite a lot, um, and, it, and it can vary. And I, I couldn't tell you exactly what was lost from this particular cask because I don't have the figures, but... Typically, we talk about losing about 2% of the volume of a cask each year. In the early years of maturation, it tends to be a little bit higher. As the whiskey ages, gets more mature, it tends to drop a little bit. But it really does, to quote John Connor, depend on the cask. And actually, this is an area that the Scotch Whiskey Research Institute has invested a huge amount of effort in researching. For the last, uh, so certainly for the three or four years that I was there, we were engaged in a project called the Matin Project, where we were looking at how warehouse environment and how how sorry or excuse me how the how losses um, evaporative losses were influenced by the warehouse environment and in turn how did the design and the construction of the warehouse influence its environment uh, utterly fascinating and, and the reality is you see losses uh, from anywhere between you know six percent of the cask every year uh, to you know as low as maybe one and a half percent but the rule of thumb is two. Um, obviously, you know, the industry would love it to be lower. There's a financial benefit to that. But interestingly, think about this, John, you know, maybe this isn't something we always consider. There's an environmental impact there because every litre of spirit that the industry makes, there's an energy input, whether that's in the distillery, whether that's um, farm machinery and fertiliser production to, 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 to grow barley. So every litre of spirit that we don't lose to the angels through evaporation or the reality is casks leak, of course, is um you know is, is is beneficial so there's an interest both from a financial perspective 
uh, from a drinking perspective, because there's more left to drink, but also from environmental sustainability in, uh, in, um, perspective to minimise losses. And the industry is very, very interested in that, unsurprisingly. Well, there's also been a, a growing interest from that point of view in how much peat to be used, Andy, as well. But, but the fact is, we use we use very 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 little amount of peat in our Scotch whisky, you know. But people, some people are concerned that we're digging it up, you know. Yeah, and again, it's an area the industry's doing, um, you know, quite a lot of research on, both in terms of getting the maximum yeah. amount of flavour from peat. So, how do you burn it? How do you store it? What's the best way to get, you know, most bang for buck when it comes to burning your peat? But also, a lot of research looking at um, the importance of taking peat from particular locations you, you you'll know and you know historically we've taken from just a handful of locations in scotland isla obviously um north bits lago um, northeast of scotland there's a big site there in orkney and all of those peats differ in composition and actually the research it shows us and actually just taste of the whiskey shows us that actually those different peats from different vegetation give different flavor to the whiskey and that's going to be an important piece of research and understanding we need when it comes to protecting the industry's, I guess, uh, ability to extract peat from these places, because the industry is obviously, you know, very important to to the UK or to Scotland. Yeah, in Scotland, uh, as, as far as peat bog per acre, Scotland the seventeenth in the world for the amount of peat bog per acreage. No way. Well. Yeah. John, I think we're probably going to end up talking a little bit about peat. Um, yes, we are. Yeah, yeah. And I wondered whether is it? Should we get Michael in so we can? I say yes, yes. Get together? yes, folks. I'm very, very pleased to announce that uh, Michael was going to join us. Michael was the master. Is it master blender, master distiller, Michael? It's master blender. Master blender from Loch Roman Group. Uh, now this is a, a fascinating. Distillery, as I mentioned at the beginning, but I think the best thing I can do is ask Michael just to introduce himself and say a little bit about it, about it before we get into the tasting. Okay, so, uh, my name's Michael Henry, of the Master Blender at the Loch Lomond Group. So I cover Loch Lomond, Glen Scotia and Little Mill distilleries. Um, I basically do three things, that's create the expressions, prepare the spirit for bottling and then manage the stock. So I look at creating the initial expressions, how we deliver that today, tomorrow, and 10, 20 years time. So it was a bit of science fiction there in terms of trying to predict the future. <laughs> and there are yeah, so many yeah. times I would love the DeLorean to go back and say, you know, we should have made so much more of this back 10 years ago, or we would have changed this 15 years ago. Absolutely. Uh, a DeLorean would be kind of the best <laughs> a blender could have. Um, yeah. So to get to where I'm at now, I, I probably if you pick up from my accent, I'm from the north coast of Ireland. So I'm, I grew up near Bush Mills. So there's a lot of distilling around that area. We had a yeah. distillery um, in production to the early 1980s and then Bush Mill itself. Um, so when it came to studying, I did my degree in brewing and distilling at Harriet Watt. I was sponsored by Bush Mills, so I worked at Bush Mills all my holidays while I was studying. Um, I've had about 25 years experience in whiskey and beer now. Um, when I graduated from Bush Mills, I went into brewing and I worked for um InBev so worked at the oh, yeah. in Belfast, so the Caffrey's Brewery. Mm. Um, it's a small brewery, so it was involved in everything: the brew house, the mashing, fermentation, yeast propagation, yeast removal from the beer, conditioning the beer, filtration. Um, so I looked after the whole uh, brewing process. And after a couple of years, I moved to Well Park, where I made tenants. Oh, years. yes, yes. You know, Glasgow, yeah. <laughs> um, so it turned out uh, my great grandmother lived in Duke Street. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. So well, I yeah. went back to where she grew up. So, sure, sure. 
So I've had a lot of experience in brewing and particularly yeast and cereals. So a lot of um, probably more about the flavour creation on that side. Before I came to Loch Lomond in 2007, and uh, that seemed a perfect fit um, because Loch Lomond, even back then, were always focused more on distillery character. And we use the different shapes of stills, different still setups, uh, different peat levels um, to create a range of distinct flavour profiles of spirit. And it's all about how we distill. Um, wood's important, but it's we use wood in a way that showcases the distillery character. Well, that's, that's fantastic, Michael. Yeah, yeah. That's what we'll hopefully talk about and share tonight. Yeah, mm. sure. I mean, I, I mean I, Andy's always uh, saying that you know, some people say that, you know, 70% of the flavour comes from the cask. And I think, Andy, what you're saying is that's not really true. It's the it's reaction of the distillery character. Uh, with the cask and stuff, which creates the, the more complex set of flavours. It it's not adding new flavours, so really, so much. But, um, yeah, that'll be fascinating. How do you want to do it, Michael? Have you got a, a slide to take us through, and then we'll talk about yeah, your... so um, if we can call up the slides, I'll just give a little bit of background to Loch Yeah, okay. As a quick introduction, we have five distillery codes, um, three for malt, two for grain. So yeah. I don't think there's many distilleries can kind of say. We've even, that. I mean, even, uh, managed, even so, managed to get get the get a few wrong, didn't we? A few years ago. Yeah. Um, is it? Is it? Yeah. I'm wondering, uh, Michael, John, is it worth that, uh, like John or I trying to just uh, for our members that maybe aren't familiar, giving a little, just a little bit on what we mean with the distillery code, and then you can pick up on what each of these codes means for you in terms of your distillation setup. Would that make sense? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So That's do you want to good. cover 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 your sort of background to Loch Lomond and then perhaps John or I can hop in or together and we can just, you know, set that up before we get into each of the whiskies. Is that a good plan? Okay. So um I'll start by giving a little bit of history to Loch Lomond. Um and that's it's really important to understand why the distillery was built because it affects our, the philosophy that was built into the distillery right from the start. Um, so we were built in the 1960s by Little Mill Distillery. Uh, Little Mill itself was founded in 1772. The wow. license to distill was 1773. So we've had this research and Little Mill was the, I think the oldest licensed distillery in Scotland. Incredible. Um, so, That's even before the French Revolution, Michael. Yeah, um, it's some time. Um, looking forward, the kind of important dates around then were 1930s when Little Mill was bought by an American, Duncan Thomas, and he was quite forward thinking, quite innovative. And it was important to him to produce, um, so following the Second World War, when there was a boom in blended whiskey. Um, distilleries wanted to produce different types of flavour so that they could capture more of the supply for making blends. And to do this, he created the straight neck pot stills that we see here. Um, and they were really, Little Mill was a lowland distillery, so he wanted to be able to produce the triple distilled lowland style, also a heavier, fuller bodied style and a peated style. Um, so we put in these stills to produce a range of flavours. Um, and when they built Loch Lomond as an expansion of Little Mill in the 1960s, the stills, they put in the same design of stills as they had from Little Mill. Um, so going on to Loch Lomond now, um, that focus on distillation as a a way of creating flavours was built into our distillery right from the start. And since then, we've expanded that. So we have our straight neck pot stills and we have our swan neck pot stills. Um, we have uh, continuous stills for malt, 
I use malted barley wash and continuous stills for wheat. So we have four different types of still, and we'll focus on two of them tonight for our single malts. Um, so that's where the one distillery, we have three single malt codes and then two single grain codes. Um, and it's all about, you know, with this distilling set that we have, there's a huge potential for flavor creation before we get to the cask. And it's really, our focus now on, is on creating flavor at the start of the whiskey making process um, in the distillery itself. So um, if we want to move on to the so next slide, um, a big part of that is fermentation. And there are three things around fermentation that we kind of focus on. Um, the first part is mashing. And we use a, a lighter ton and we take a very slow takeoff of spirit from the lighter ton. This gives us a very clear wort. Uh, clear wort's important. If you drag any material, any particles from the mash into the wort, they coat the yeast and they interfere with the yeast absorbing nutrients. So the yeast doesn't grow properly if it's coated in all these particles from a dirty wash. So we take a very, sorry, dirty wort. So we take a very clear wort. That allows the yeast to grow really strongly, get all the nutrients in. Um, and produce all the kind of estuary fruity flavors that we're looking for. The second thing we look at is the yeast type. And we use um, two types of yeast in our normal production. So we use um, a dis both distillers yeast. So we use um, a dry yeast from Lalamond for our swan neck pot stills. And we use a mix of M and MX yeast from Kerry and our straight neck pot stills. Um, and that just gives different flavors that suit the, the different shapes of stills. Um, and then time will ferment for longer than most distillers. Um, so we'll ferment for 96 hours as a standard. And um, we have fermented up to about three weeks. Um, over our uh, annual shutdown. Um, so if we want to move on, we'll talk a little bit about wine yeast. Um, so yeah, is that a good time for us to pull the, the dram if you, we haven't already, Michael? So um, wine yeast, um, for yeast, yeast does two things. It converts the sugar in the wort to alcohol but as it's doing that, it also produces flavor active compounds. Um, they'll produce fruity, citrusy, grassy, all these different types of flavors come from how the yeast grows and produces flavor. At Loch Lomond, we've been trialing wine yeast since 2004, so over 15 years now. And we've used up to eight different strains so for wine yeast, um, it's important that wine yeast normally grows on the sugars that you get from grapes, but the sugars that you get in malted barley are different. So out of these eight yeasts, some of them grow better than others in the malted barley wort. And the second thing is that for those that do grow, you need to be able to produce, um, have a flavor impact. So if they're just producing a small amount of flavor, it's really not worth using them. They need to have a, an impact on the flavor that they're creating. Um, and then lastly, you need to have a still set up. So if you've created all these flavors by using a special type of yeast, the way you distill has to be tailored to capture those specific flavors. Okay. And um, with our different shapes of pot still, the different way we run the stills, you know, we're perfectly set up to do that. Brilliant. We're getting lots of good questions, Michael, coming through. Okay, so um, I don't know if... Thanks. So we... I think somebody asked at the start how we create 
the different types of uh, spirit styles that we do. And we yeah. do that changing three things, the shape of the pot still, so we have swan neck or straight neck pot stills, the way we operate the stills. So for our straight neck pot stills, we'll run on a wide cut or a narrow cut, and then we'll change the level of peat in the malted barley. So we'll use unpeated, medium peated, and heavy peated malt. Um, so if we want to move on, John, if you want to talk about the first whiskey. Yeah, from yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah well, I think that's timely, Michael, because um, if, I mean, correct the game me if I'm wrong, but I think this one um, talks a little bit to the discussion we were having there about um, wine yeasts. Um, and uh, so I think it's a good time to get this in the glass. I already have because I couldn't wait. Um it smells absolutely lovely. I think a few of our members have already got it in the glass. I've been seeing yeah, a few, some. A few, a few people have said that, what they think they're getting from it. Yeah, magic. But I think it's. Uh, I mean, it's just it's, it's it's wonderful in the nose. It's very. I get quite a lot of what say, cereal from the nose. Uh, very spicy as well. <coughs> Yummy. Lovely and sweet. Nice the strength. The strength. It's um sixty point eight. You would, would not think that. So um my my my, I, I, my understanding and Michael, you know, you're gonna be much closer to this. This this is an example where a wine yeast has been used. Is that right? Yeah. So this is where we've used a wine yeast in our uh, swan neck pot stills. Okay. So um, the swan neck pot stills gives us a more floral, spicy character. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Uh, it's a fuller body. Yeah. It's like yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. The body the body is fine. Uh, it's less select. That's because it's less selective. It will allow more flavor compounds to pass from the still, through the still neck and into the new make spirit. Um, so, Michael, we, do you collect a, a, essentially a full spirit run in this case from around about, what, 73 to 63 thereabouts? Yeah, so we'll take um, like a standard spirit cut from about 73 down to 68. That will give us a strength in receiver of about 70%. Okay. Um, so this is kind of a non-selective. It captures a lot of uh, flavours from the wash, which gives it a fuller body as well as the kind of floral, spicy characters, yeah. getting heavier kind of sulfury notes. <laughs> yeah. That uh, means it takes longer to mature. Okay. And um, there's, there's some great uh, – I did. I was just watching some of the contributions coming up there and mentions of humbugs and, and other spicy-like characters. Okay, um, I'm cinnamon and ginger biscuits, actually. Yeah. Chocolate biscuits. And so, 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 Michael, you're saying you, you end up producing a, a relatively heavily sulfury spirit then. So, uh, I think this has then been sold uh, into, what, American oak, heavily charred? Is that correct? Or? Yeah. So, this takes longer to mature than the spirit from the street neck pot stills. So, I would use this. I would start using spirit from this still at about eight years old. Okay. Um, but I think it's probably around the 10 or 12 mark before... Um, I get it kind of coming really clean. So this is kind of a, a sweet spot for me this age. Um, so this is 2009. That's the 10, 11 year old. So although it's been in first fill bourbon, there's still a, a big little distillery character here. Yeah, there is. Quite a few people I've seen have mentioned, and Joel included, whose comment just cropped up, cropped up is mintiness. Can you explain that one from either a distillate or even a cask point of view, Michael? Um, I think that kind of herbal note comes from the yeast. Um, so I've said a floral kind of general note. Um, the wine yeast will, will produce um, more thiols that give a, a citrusy character. So that gives like the fresh kind of mint lemon type characters um 
really gives a, a nice kind of effervescence or sherbet yeah. Um so, you know, Just to really geek out, yeah, Michael, yeah. you think that mintiness is probably some sort of ester produced by the yeasts? Uh, yeah. Okay, cheers. That's interesting because I, I also wondered about, you know, herbal character, you know, the kind of green leafy, which may be, you know, a, a separate origin. That's nice. That's interesting. Thank you. And, you know, address is a, 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 a taste in lots of us, so lots of people are putting up. Michael, have you did any experiments with barley types? Or has it been the yeast you've played with? It's mainly yeast we've worked yeah. um, For us, yeah. you know, we've, for malting barley, we use, I think we've been using Concerto for the last kind of 10 okay. years. Okay. Okay. So I was asking the guys at Brew Claddy who play around with barley types, barley from different areas, same barley from different areas, trying to establish terroir, but they don't touch the yeast because they're trying to establish the different flavours that they're getting from the different barley types and don't want to confuse it with the yeast. I guess you're just doing exactly the opposite. You're just... We're, we're, yeah. we're using... Um, you know, we're changing the yeast and we're changing the still. Yes, yes, yes. We keep the barley the same, so that we yeah yeah we, you don't want to change too many variables at one time. That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you're wanting, um, if you're trying something new, you want to know yeah. you're creating that flavor. Yes, that's right. That's right. Change one thing at a time. I, I like the scientific controlled approach, Michael. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it's something that. Um, with spirit, it's a lot harder to do. Um, okay. yeah, change something with, like if you're using a, say if you want to change a, like a, do a cask finish, you're mm. talking six, 12 months and you know if yeah. that track has worked or not. If you do work with spirit, so if you change the yeast or change your still, you're talking 10, 12 years, really. Yes, yes. Well, spirit's ready. Um, I mean, you, so, so, so Michael, that's something that super interests me is this idea that, you know, we, we, we can play around with spirit character. And I think you're right, you know, yeast is the, the first place to go for. So, for everyone listening, yeast is probably, you know, the, the, the fermentation is the, the major point of flavor creation, isn't it? But, you, you know, so you can play about with yeast, you can play about with cereals, arguably, you might get novel flavor. But it's whether those novel flavor compounds are going to survive maturation. And I suppose what I'm wondering is, have you come up with any way of modeling that, trying to accelerate that to ensure all this wonderful playing you're doing is going to give you something different in the end? The first thing you have to do is capture those flavors in the Sure. Game. So if you've created all these flavors in the wash, what we find is that how you distill it has a big impact on... It's a good point. Um, flavor. So be, even before you get to ensuring that they survive maturation, they have to yeah. get into the new mix spirit. Yeah. And I think a, a good example of that, actually, not with novel flavor necessarily, is peaty flavors. I think we're going to come to that about. Yeah. So, okay. we, you see, how you distill can be. Yeah. Different shapes of stills are change how selective the stills are. Okay. So stills allow some flavors to pass and hold other flavors in the still. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with reflux. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, maybe maybe we'll explain that for the members and everyone listening. Yeah. So, I, yeah, the best way I can put it is that reflux is the principle that as flavors evaporate from the wash and rise through the still. Yeah, you've actually got that described here somewhere, yeah. So they'll start to cool and fall back down into the body of the still. So if you have a lot of reflux, you have a lot of cooling. So a lot of the flavors will fall back into the still, and that makes it harder for flavor to go out of the still. So the less reflux you have, the less selective the still is, and the more flavor passes through the still. The higher the reflux, the harder it is for flavor to leave the still, so the more selective and the tighter your control of the flavors will be. So if, if, if I 
take my lab coat off and, and kind of try and think it really simplistically, reflux is almost like redistillation, is it? Is that fair? Yep. Um, so it's probably um, you can change the amount of reflux by changing the shape of the still. Mm -hmm. so, um, a well-known example of that is uh, Glenn Morangy when they talk yeah. about having the tallest stills in Scotland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That increasing the still height increases the amount of reflux there is. Yeah. Um, I think somebody's talking about the heel at Fetter Cairn. Yeah. Or the heel. The still. So these are all different techniques that the stillers use to increase the amount of reflux in the still and make their stills more selective. Well, I'll tell you what, folks, let's say every, everybody seems to have enjoyed that 135. And I have, we've just heard from Nadja and Jens and Frank Fats. Hello there, folks. Now, obviously, you enjoyed it too. So maybe we should move on now to the 112. Yeah. Have you got the the slide for that one there, Michael or Andrew? Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Here we go. Here we go. Yeah. So the the distillery codes for Loch Lomond Distillery um, one three five is for the Swan Neck pot still. Yeah. Um, one one two and one two two are both for the Straight Neck pot still. Yeah, but you have to you have to remember, Michael, you were pointing out earlier back in August. 18 in a filter. We actually admitted we made a mistake or two with 112s. Yeah. We had a few 135s. We called 112s. 1127, 11212, I think it was. Yeah. So it's sort of with nine, with, with the eight different spirit styles for single malt, and we can't really give us eight different distillery codes. So mm -hmm. I believe. It was really through discussions with ourselves and the society. We came up with the distillation styles as the basis yes. for the distillery yes. codes. Yes. So the first distillation style is the Swan Neck Pot Still. That's 135, and that can be yeah. unpeated, medium peated, or heavily peated. Sure. Or 112 and 122, they're both distilled in the straight neck pot stills. And we'll talk a, bit, a little bit more about now um, the difference between sure. one, two, and one, two, two. Mm. So go through the stills themselves. Um, they were initially designed by the Little Mill Distillery. And at the time, Little Mill were a traditional lowland and they were triple distilling. Mm -hmm. Their aim was to create a triple distilled character from a double distillation. So they... Oh find this still that would give them put as much kind of reflux sure okay still. Yeah. so you're really cutting out that third distillation and the way you run the still it can give you that same kind of triple distilled character from a, a double distillation sure and they do that by um, using a straight neck and putting copper plates in the neck of the still to slow the progress of the vapor through the still neck. Um, so there's I think a single plate in the wash still and 17 plates in the spirit still. Michael, are they vertical or horizontal? They're horizontal and they're fixed in position. Um, so we can't change the plate setup. Um, and, and, and it, forgive me, is that... Is that what we know as a Loman still? No. Okay. So that's a lot of people confuse these stills with Loman stills, and they were a, a separate development. Both stills work in the principle of reflux. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The straight neck pot stills we have were only ever used at Little Mill Distillery in Loch Lomond. Uh, Loman stills were um, a Hiram and Walker development, so they were mm. used at Inverleven Distillery in Dumbarton, at Glenburgie, Milton. Glenburgie, yeah, yeah. And they're actually created, they were designed before Loch Lomond Distillery was built. Mm -hmm. Named, the first distillery that was put into was Inverleven, 
which is near Loch Lomond. And that's why they were called Lomond Stills. Mm. So they're called Lomond after the lake before the distillery existed. And actually, while we're on them, Mark Lindsay is one of our watchers. He's saying Loman stills were banned by the SWA. Do you want to comment on that? I because I I'm um, ignorant. Wouldn't know because um, we've never used Loman stills, so it's not something that um, we've ever came up against. Uh, I, think, yeah. I think Michael, not for, though we've got three three malt whiskey coats for for Loch Lomond, we've also got. The reason for our distillery codes, other distilleries, is because of low still use. As you mentioned, Glen Burgie, for example, you know, uh, that's been used in a couple of times for the different codes we've used because of the difference it creates. Yeah. I think other distilleries, I think, are Springbank. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think they have. Uh, two or three codes for um, Springbank. Yeah, we've got a yeah Springbank, Longro, and Hazelburn. Yeah, Hazelburn. So they've um, uh, a triple distilled version like Hazelburn. So they have a couple of codes. Yeah, there, 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 there was a there was a comment just back then. I I think it was it Rob. Or I might have missed it, but I'm um, saying this is super fruity. Um, yeah, um, do you want to talk to that, Michael? You know, in terms of you know, I can see yes, yeah, installation concentrate. Yeah, I'll pick up on that because it's a good observation. Um, so basically, with these stills, you know, we talked about having the plates in for creating reflux, we also have the ability to cool the head of the still, okay? Um, so we can run, um oh. So we can run cold water through the top section of the still oh. really, and makes it even harder for heavier flavors to pass out of the still and into the new make spirit. Um, so if you look at the graph with the collection strengths for this still and for this distillation style, a very tight cut. So we'll take mm. Up from 90 down to 80 percent. Interesting. Receiver of um, 85 percent. So when you think that, if you compare that to the Swan Neck, where the strength in the receiver was 70 percent, we're now up yeah. to 5 percent. So it's a very tight cut, and that's at the start of the spirit run. So we're, this is really very selective, and it captures all those. It's the fruitiest. Kind of all the solvent ester kind of light mm. at the start of the spirit run. And um, so a very intense fruit character. Michael, do you mind if I just chip in and, and answer the question from Martin there while it's because it was just up on the screen? Sorry, I know it takes us off track a little bit, but we'll get back. Um, does the society buy casks young and allow them to mature or essentially buy a bottle? Uh, the former Martin and you know pretty much as a rule we'll be buying casts of um, a relatively young spirit um, in fact even new fillings or new make spirit which will fill into our own wood and then we'll take them through our own maturation program which you and our spirits over um, spirits manager along with Kai our spirits director and myself oversee um, and then to present the cast to the the panel for selection for bottling so I would have said most of our casks Certainly today, I bore relatively young and then go through our own maturation program using our own expertise in wood, our own selection of wood, and our additional maturation program where we tend to what we call re-rack spirit from the traditional American oak bourbon cask that we buy the spirit in into maybe other wine casks. And I think this is an example here where actually this has been filled into an ex-red wine barrique um, to, I guess, further diversify and shove the flavour in a different different direction so i'm not going to go on anymore because um michael it's your show right now but i just wanted to to answer that one so we were talking about really concentrating this fruity character yeah, through so, that, um, so the kind of signature flavors for this distillation style are like peach pear kind of soft orchard fruits mm -hmm. 
And because it is selective, it gives you more of some more medium body, so it's a lighter spirit. Yeah. It's fast maturing because um, we're not taking through any heavy, oily, sulfury notes. It's very clean, sweet, new make. Mm. This means that we can use this from um, probably about five years old compared to eat for the swan neck. Um, and we do this, we distill in this style with unpeated malted barley and mm -hmm. malt, malted barley. Um, so there's only, we only use two uh, different um, peat levels for this distillation style. Fantastic. I really like it. I mean, it just, again, it belies its strength. It's just, uh, it's one of those whiskies where if I've only got a glass of it, I'd be terrified, but water in it in case I waste it. Or I don't need, oh, it's good, good with water. I need to get a bottle. I, get a bottle. <laughs> it's, it's, I think it's utterly, utterly yummy, Michael. I mean, you know, fabulous spirit. Um, and uh, I think the cask has really just shoved it in a really nice direction to give it I mean, it's landed in deep, rich and dried fruits. That's where our panel has signed it. And, you know, I'm guessing, you know, with the French wet red wine barrique, you know, European oak, giving more tannins, giving more of the dried fruit-like character, maybe some of the influence of the of the wine that, that was in the cask before it. Um, I think that's absolutely yummy. I mean, that's a really good example of the, you know, the cask and the spirit working well together. And uh, so, so just out of curiosity, I mean, um, Michael, is that – um, how you present this particular spirit, or have we done something a little bit different here, stick it in the uh, wine cask? No, so we've um, so it was filled in to refill American oak. Yeah, we would fill most of our uh spirit into refill American oak. We'll probably yeah. put a third into first fill. Okay, we'll actually, we'll spend about a million pounds on bourbon barrels every year. Yeah. Tend to use that more for our younger expressions. Yeah. And then, so we'll give, um, when we use bourbon, we'll use it for a three to five year fill on the first. And then the second fill will be a longer, sort of 10 to 18 year old year fill. Mm -hmm. And okay. uh, American oak um, will shorten the time when it's a first fill to control. Mm -hmm influence and then for our kind of higher ages we'll use refill wood yeah. you get softer wood influence and it keeps that distillery character to the very character um, yeah so 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 uh, it'd be fair that to say that this is maybe a, a sort of a different style that you would produce than you would produce which i guess is you know the the, the kind of interest in 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 in, in, in a you know society bottling um we tend not to do a, a lot of wood finishes yeah uh, as it happens we uh, we're in partnership with the rna for the open golf oh yeah and as part of that we uh do a it's called an open course collection so we'll release like um a limited edition that has a link to the course where the open is played at every year um, last year it was played at Port Rush in Northern Ireland, so three miles where I from where I grew up. Um, <laughs> so I know the area well, so it was a bit of an incentive to make it something special. Um, some local knowledge: Port Rush is home to two winners of the Open, two winners of the Claret Chug. So I used a Claret wine finish with this spirit style. So who are we talking about, Michael? We're talking uh, who? Who are the the golfers are Darren Clark, Darren Clark, yeah, and 2011, um, and Fred Daly from I think it was, a, it was 1949 or nine. Right, right, I never knew Fred Daly. He was even Irish. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. So, um, he is from Portrush. Um, okay, okay, good stuff. Um, a little bit of golf trivia. Can, 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 can I can I get us geeking out on a bit of science again? So there was a question that I think it would be a shame to miss because it, it was up on the screen. I think it was Ronnie's. Andrew, can you put that one back up again about the plates and the holes? Well, there, there, there was a question going back to you rectifying plates, Michael, and 
Sorry, Stephen. So, I mean, this is a super interesting question. Uh, is there a hole for the vapor to progress up the column? And I guess this is um, um, my question: Is do the holes line up or are they staggered? Yeah, the there's actually bubble caps. Ah, the liquid pools around the holes. Um, so it's the same design of plate for each. So each plate is the same design, and the holes roughly line up, but they're um, like bubble caps on the the holes. So it actually uh, makes the progression of the vapor through the still very slow. Yeah. I, I was just trying to, I remember seeing a bubble cap like column still. I was trying to think where I could send people to, to understand that. I think it was a, it's actually a Harriet Watt. Were you there? Was it, was that there when you were there? Um, so I was at Harriet Watt from 95 to 98. Oh, I don't know. Anyway, um, Cool. Anyway, they're pretty interesting, but uh, I guess try and look, like, look them up, folks, um, what that looks like. Anyway, thanks for that, Michael and Stephen. Uh, thanks for the question because it's uh, really interesting. Can I just uh, say before we move on to the last one, uh, you know we were doing this thing about trying to find out what happened on the day of distillation for each of these. Well, we've checked the 21st of March 2001, and I can tell you nothing happened on that day. Something must have happened. <laughs> this this whiskey got made. That was all that happened, you know. <laughs> We're gonna have a load of pissed off members writing in there saying, "I got married that day. I was born." Yeah, yeah, day. yeah, yeah. I know, I know, I know. know. No, we'll never be the under the web. <laughs> Sorry, Michael. We digress. Um, should we pull this um, peaty little number? So I think because we've had three very different flavor profile whiskies from your three different still setups, but. I guess this is about peat as much as it is about distillation, yeah? Yeah. Um, so this is the third spirit style from Loch Lomond, and it's the the straight neck pot still again, but with mm -hmm. a spirit cut. So for Raz, distillery code 112 used narrow spirit cut from 90 to 80%. Mm -hmm. U2. We use the straight neck pot still, but we take the spirit cut from 90 down to 55%. So it's a very wide spirit cut. It's a strength and receiver of about um, 65%. Um, so that's even a, a lower strength and receiver than the swan neck pot still. Mm. So more um, apple and lemon. And fruit notes, citrusy notes, with that wider cut, a wider cut. Um, it's a medium to full body spirit, and it's we do this in three peat levels: so unpeated, medium peated, and heavily peated. Um, and you can also see if you look at the graphic, you'll notice that there's a red line on the mm. head cooling. So again. In addition to the wide spirit cut, we're turning off the still head cooling. So with the wide cut and the, the head still head cooling off, we're allowing more flavors to pass through the still. We're a lot reducing the amount of reflux and we're making the still less selective. So it's so this style sits between. One three five and one one two in terms of uh, the body. So, so, me, sir, can I ask a question then? Or so, is this because you're trying to capture some of these peaty flavours principally, or is it is there more to it than that? Because um, we do this at un, with unpeated malt as well. That's that's kind of what I thought. Because I I thought you were going to say this is we only do peated runs for this. Okay, we kind of make it sometimes before. And this, I think, is the best distillation style for wine yeast because it's slightly oh. more selective than one three five. So it takes out some of the heavier flavors that mask the flavors that the wine yeast are creating. Yeah, but it's not that selective as one one two that it it doesn't 
leave a lot of the flavors in the the body of the still. So this one is particularly good with wine yeast to capturing all those kind of fruit flavors that um, from the fermentation. Yeah, 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 yeah. Makes sense. Uh, sorry, can we? I did, can we? Can we just? I think it was Mark's question. The names are flipping by. Uh, where do you take your peat from? Um, that, Andrew, maybe you can pop the question up again. Uh, sorry, Stuart. Stuart Denovan. Where does the peat come from? So we'll use uh, peat from the northeast of Scotland. Um, so it's commercially malted, uh, <clears throat> a commercial yeah. peated malt. Um, and we'll buy unpeated and heavily peated. Our heavily peated is peated to 50 ppm phenol. Yeah. Um, so when we run on heavily peated malt, um, we or for heavily peated spirit, we'll use a hundred percent heavily peated malted barley. Okay. Yeah. Medium peated, we'll take fifty percent heavy peated malt and fifty percent unpeated malt to give us an average of twenty-five ppm phenol. Okay. So I think probably a good time now to talk about phenol and ppm. Yeah. Can I, can I quickly just say, Tim Rowe, can you drop us an email? I think you're on the panel for writing tasting notes if you've just come up with that. So I don't know if you saw <laughs> that, John. That was, that, was, that was awesome. Yes, please, M Michael, let's geek out and talk about phenolic compounds and peaty flavour. Um, can I just – I mean, so just, just a wee comment on the origin thing. So my understanding is, and this is obviously broadly speaking, the peat from the northeast of Scotland – tends to give more of a you know smoky character than say either where you get the more kind of iodine medicinally germline tcp fair i think you touched on part of that reason before um where where the plants grow that go to make the peat mm -hmm. it's the composition of the peat mm -hmm. so the first variable in um, a peated whiskey is where does the peat come from because that changes the composition of the peat and it's important to say here is that when we talk about peat we talk about ppm phenol as mm. the measure of strength of peat ppm phenol isn't a measurement of one single phenol mm. it's a measurement of seven different flavor compounds so not only do you have the total amount but what's important is the individual amounts of these seven different fuels. And where the peak comes from affects this balance between the different phenols, but also how you distill changes the balance between the different phenols. So yeah. If you look I, at the graphic here, um, we see that the you look at the swan neck still, so number three here, you get a big medicinal phenol. So at what we said before, the swan neck isn't selective. So it allows all those peak flavors to pass through the still into the new mix spirit. So you get all those big aggressive phenolic medicinal compounds. And you'll see that's the kind of the highest bar you'll get a good amount of smoke and you get a good amount of spice. Yeah. So those phenolic flavors are so aggressive and flavor active. They mask a lot of the smoke and spice character. If you look at the, this, the low collection strength with the straight neck pot still, so distillery code 122, you'll see it as you move to the straight neck still, you're getting far more selective already and you're cutting a lot of those um, big phenolic characters. You're keeping most of the smoke and you're keeping most of the spice. Yeah. A lot of people are talking about smoky character rather than medicinal. Yeah. Yeah. The way we've distilled, we've stopped the medicinal character coming into the new make. Mm. So I said, say a higher cut, Michael, yeah. So this is the, no, it's the wide cut from yeah. the pot still. So this is the, the shape of the still is doing the selective work here. Sure. Mm. 
Um, but I, my, I mean, that, seeing that that data for the different distillation setup is really interesting, Michael. And I think you know a, a really big takeaway there for everyone is, you know, when we talk about phenolics and PPMs, you know, we're talking about a whole lot more than medicinal. And yeah, you know, you've got medicinal smoky, you've you've got spicy there. I think that's um, you know sort of guacol like flavors. But um, you know, I think I'd be right in saying. Um, Phenolic compounds can even almost have a vanilla sweetness to them as well. Yeah, so when we talk about spice, we're talking vanilla, clove, yeah, type flavors. Um, so for the phenolics, we're looking at phenol, ocresol, and mp cresol. Yeah. Yeah. For smokiness, we're talking about guacol and four methyl phenol. Yeah. For spice, we're looking at four methyl guacol. Yeah, so sure. We've had a lot of work. We've had our different peated spirit types analyzed by Tatlock and Thompson. Yeah. And um, so we know the the individual phenol balance of each of these three spirit styles. Yeah. And if we think about this, what we're tasting tonight is distilled from 50 ppm phenol. Mm. We think that's the same as Ardbeg, Lagavulin. Sure. But this, because it's distilled in a very different way, gives you a very different aspect of the peak character. Yeah. Absolutely. Can, can, you, can you say what the total, you know, in the spirit now, I don't mean the barley, obviously, what's the <laughs> level of total marker phenols in that? You know, so 50 to uh, what? So the phenol recovery, um, the swan neck stills will be about 25 ppm in the new mix. Okay. So half. The uh, straight necks at the low collection strength, um, wide cut. So for 122, it's about 15 ppm. So 12, yeah. 15 ppm. And then the. Um, and for one one two, it's probably about seven ppm. There you go. Okay. Okay. So, so I, I think you've given everyone a little nugget to go and geek out and impress, or, or rather impress their mates with now. So everyone's geeking out about how pp how high the ppm is in their latest Brutaladi or whatever. Then and then all about ppm. Yeah. Michael, that was, that's fantastic. That, I, and everybody. Thank you. Everybody's loved these three whiskies. There's no doubt about that. It's stunning. Lovely. So somebody, asked, somebody asked earlier, Michael, about tours. You don't do tours, Lock Lock, do you? Um, it's not out of choice. Um, you've probably heard me talking tonight. There's a lot to Loch Lomond. Yes. And having people into the distillery and showing them around is the best way of kind of people understanding that. Yeah. But the, because of the layout of the distillery, we're actually split over two different sites. We have a public road going between us. Yeah, yeah. It's it's not a great layout for taking people around. Sure, okay. okay. We're talking about five minutes to walk from the offices up to the distillery. Um, so the physical layout of the um, distillery kind of counts against us for tours. Yeah, I understand, I understand. I understand. And also, uh, we're a, a coma site, and that means that we store a significant amount of whiskey on site, and that means that we're treated as a like an oil refinery for safety reasons. So we have to control the people coming on to site. Okay. 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 So it's harder to like bring people in uh, before you come on site. You need to have. Um, a health and safety induction. Mm, sure. So it's we can bring people on the site off spec. I understand. It's coming. Yes. And we need to put them through a, a training session before they can come on and see us. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Lots of comments about how much people have enjoyed this because not could, could, normally we don't, we don't have that kind of, we don't have this kind of detail. 
in our tasting events, of it, and this has just been fantastic. I think it's opened a lot of people's eyes up. I think you're, <laughs> I think you're going to get a lot of sales as a result of this, yes. But I think, I think it's um, other thing is that somebody was asking about can we buy these bottles? I think if you've joined on with the tasting pack, you have a, an email and a code that you can, you can, you can go on to the site from 9 p.m. tonight, half an hour ago, and you can buy all of these bottles apart from number seven, singly or in packages. So please all be feel free to do that. Don't don't please buy them all. So I'm going to go on and kind of try and get the three Loch Lomond ones myself. <laughs> the other thing is, folks, we try to do these uh, tastings ever since uh, lockdown happened. The next big one for us will be the 6th of September. We're having an on virtual gathering. There'll be some live stuff going on at the vaults, but look out for it on the site. 6th of September, the gathering. Uh, in previous years, under normal circumstances, if people come from all over the world to join us at the vault, so try and join with us virtually. That will be terrific. We're going to I'm going to thank Michael, first of all. So thank you very much, Michael. That's absolutely been tremendous. I hope you've enjoyed it yourself. I'm I, guess, um, I think sharing whiskey is... Just um, talking about how we make it, it's as good as drinking it for us. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I, so, I, I like to make whiskey from you know, when I left school. I, you know, I chose to come into whiskey, so um, I love whiskey and talking about the flavor. I think it's yeah. Yeah. You, you, you're gonna regret saying that because I think, I think you and Andy must be brothers. From different mothers or something, because that's what he's all about as well. well Michael, you, Michael yeah. you remember I came across with my colleagues from Swery, uh, and I think unfortunately you got another commitment, so we didn't have a lot of time together, sadly. But yeah. let's get you across to the vaults or Queen Street. Um, really? Really? Well, well, you've, you're open in Glasgow now, so oh, that's true. Sorry, yeah, Glasgow. I I'm, getting Glasgow Street. I'm going to try and see Michael in Glasgow next time I'm up. Right, yeah. well, um, anyway, you, you, you've asked for it now. Um, if you don't mind, I'll come and grill you yeah. on um, rectification. The, the thing I would like to do, but we're going to show you, all you members, a short video at the end, only that hardly lasts any time at all, but it's just a means of saying goodbye. But we like to do a little toast at the end. We were looking at dates before. Now, when we drank 7242, uh, for, uh, whatever date it was, kind of see it here now. But there was uh, a, in, 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 May 19. In our unfiltered, no, no, uh, uh, the, 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 the precursor for unfiltered, just our newsletter back then. And we had a, a poem that a member sent in. It was printed in the magazine. So I dug it out today and I'm going to give it to you now as a means of raising a little toast. Now in Scotland, the word want, needing something, want, is some sometimes said want, want, okay? So understand that, okay? So this member wrote in his little poem, and he said, The Lord is my shepherd, I will not want, as long as there's whiskey in Glen Grant. And when it's done, no more to pour, we'll up the line to Crag and Moher. Ajiba. In good spirit, everyone. Thank you, Andy. I really enjoyed it.